Hello, my name is Francisco Veloso, and I'm the Dean at Imperial College Business School, and I'm absolutely delighted to welcome you all here this evening for a very special event that we have at universities, and a very special event because we're doing it with Tarun. So these inaugural lectures is really a unique opportunity that we have across the university to bring you know, some of our very talented academics to tell us about the amazing work that they're doing in their area of expertise in areas that they really are unique in the world. And that's certainly the case for Tarun that I'm introducing tonight. Just to, before doing that, just to let you know, I mean, I'll be doing some introductory uh, remarks, to, mostly to introduce uh, Tarun. So Tarun will then give his, um, um, his inaugural lecture, and then we'll have a period of Q&A, so start preparing your own questions to, um, to the presentation that Tarun uh, is, is gonna give. It's gonna be moderated by Franklin Allen, our Vice Dean uh, Faculty and Research, uh, and then we'll have a vote, a vote of thanks uh, uh, at the end by John Campbell, who, 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 Tarun, who, who Franklin will, will, will introduce. So that's the plan for the evening, and we have you know, many of you here today, but we also have quite a good uh, group uh, online, in fact, um, and so the welcome is not only for those that are here, but also those that are digitally uh, connecting to us uh, in this brand new hybrid world that we're, all, that we're all part of. And so, going back to Tarun. Tarun is gonna talk us, to us about finance in general, but specifically about household finance, an area that he is really at the forefront of. And as he will explain, you know, this is, of course, an important area that whether we want it or not, whether we like it or not, we directly engage because we are all households and the decisions that we do are very significant decisions in the economy. We buy cars, we buy houses, we get loans. I mean, all of these things, of course, have major impacts in the way that economies work. And so understanding this dynamic is absolutely vital and that's exactly what Tarun has been doing for throughout his career in a very unique way. But as he will also explain, we're actually in a new era in terms of our own understanding of household finance, and that's what makes it particularly exciting, uh, you know, in general in terms of our understanding, but to learn about the work that Tarun has been doing and will continue to do. So a little bit about Tarun and his journey into today. You know, originally from India, he then has been moving across continents in his academic and professional uh, journey. So he went into the US to study at Williams College for his uh, BA in mathematics, and then he crossed over to the UK to do an MPhil um, in economics at the University of Cambridge. Uh, and then he went back across the Atlantic to Harvard to do his PhD, um, and then back again to this side of the Atlantic, uh, to Oxford, as, uh, as an assistant professor where he started his career, stayed there for 10 years, and then we were very fortunate that a few years ago, uh, Tarun decided to join us right here uh, at Imperial, and so this lecture got a little bit delayed because of the reason that we, of course, all are very <laughs> aware of, which is COVID, uh, that delayed a variety of these lectures that we fail are much, uh, are very, very nice to be able to, to have them, in, uh, to have them in, um, in person. So, of course, within is very distinguished academic curriculum, and uh, Tarun has been publishing at the forefront uh, of this area in some of the leading journals, but not only that, you know, Tarun is the, the editor of the Review of Financial Studies, which is one of the three premier global journals in the area of financial economics, and he has a very extensive involvement in both regulatory, professional bodies, leadership, and policy. And so he's the director of the European Finance Association. He's um, a research fellow at the, at the CEPR, uh, a senior academic fellow at the Asian Bureau of Finance and Economic Research, and a non-resident senior fellow at the National Council of Applied Economic Research. Um, you know, his work has been uh, granted with a variety of, uh, of awards, and he's been featured in you know, diverse set of outlets from The Economist to The Financial Times, CNBC, BBC, and he's of course given many speeches around the world, here in the UK, the US, uh, throughout, throughout Asia. But he's also, as I mentioned, quite involved in policy advice and, um, and influence. And so 
That work includes being the chairman of the Interregulatory Committee on Household Finance that was constituted by the Reserve Bank of, of, of India, who produced a very influential, a very influential um, uh, report um, and uh, has been a visiting uh, scholar at the Economic Advisory Council to the Prime Minister of India and an economic advisor to European Securities and Markets Authority um, uh, closer uh, to home and, um, and uh, an, uh, uh, an allocation advisory board member for the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund um, and, you know, among many other roles. And so this, just to give you a hint of the esteem, the impact, the relevance of Tarun's work. And so Tarun, absolutely delighted to be opening up the, the, the panel here today and to invite you to give us um, your inaugural lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you, Francis. Okay, uh, is the mic on? Super. Okay, great. Uh, with that kind of introduction, I'm guaranteed to fail. Um, so I thought I'd just kick off and tell you a little bit about what's been occupying my time and the time of many other people who've been working in this area um, now uh, over the last, uh, so I've been working in this area for about close to 15 years now. Uh, so maybe a little bit of a, a kind of flavor of what it is that we're doing and kind of where we'd like to see the field going. So. Let me kick off by uh, saying something that I think should, uh, I hope, be obvious to, to all of you, that households are really the pivotal decision-making uh, agents in financial markets uh, and indeed the broader economy. And this is for a number of different reasons. You know, your savings and investment decisions uh, make you ultimately the owner of productive corporations in the economy. Uh, household borrowing uh, constitutes roughly half the lending of, of financial institutions. Household tax payments finance the activities of governments. Um, and in fact, uh, you know, as we're now uh, witnessing, uh, you know, there's, there's a, lot of, uh, a, a lot of focus on households, especially given uh, the environment that we're in uh, at the moment. Now, academia has been studying households for quite some time, and in particular their financial decisions, and household finance is a very fast-growing field of scientific inquiry. Uh, and what the field has been focused on up until this point uh, has been focusing on describing household financial behavior and decision making and focusing on identifying common errors that many of us make in the big decisions that we take um, in mortgages and buying houses, in terms of the pensions that we take on, the retirement savings that we do, even our day-to-day -day, uh, checking and savings account decisions, uh, including being overdrawn, for example. Um, this field has been sort of growing very rapidly recently because uh, there's very high quality granular data that's increasingly becoming available and that's not just in the developed countries, it's all over the world. Um, and so this is a, a very important field of inquiry that is growing incredibly fast at the moment. Uh, and um, uh, the, the questions that people have been tackling in this field are hugely consequential for both economic and financial stability, as you might uh, have seen during the global financial crisis. Uh, and of course, many of the concerns about financial stability now also stem from the impact on household budgets uh, that are coming. Um, so what sorts of questions do academics tackle here? Well, one of the things that we, th we try to think about is optimal policy design. How should we design monetary, fiscal, and regulatory policy to benefit households and taking into account the way that households make decisions? Uh, the other one is financial innovation, which is what types of financial innovation should we encourage? Uh, when FinTech is coming in and there's lots of growth, what does that mean? What are the risks? Um, and in a sense, I mean, the, these questions have become even more pertinent recently because of the two, two very important major trends that many of us have been thinking about, um, both in academic circles as well as in policy and in practice, and touches many of you. The first one is that there's this massive focus on inequality, and rightly so, uh, because of the fact that it's been increasing tremendously over the course of the last five decades or thereabouts. Uh, and part of this, uh, and part of the inquiry that we've been doing in household finance is, to what extent uh, are these um, attributable to differences in financial management ability between wealthy households and, and less wealthy households? Uh, the other thing, of course, is technology is entering our lives in all kinds of areas. Finance is not an exception. And of course, the question really is, what risks come with that adoption of, of financial technology, as well as the opportunities that are coming with that? Now, what I wanna to talk to you about today is about how we're trying to move the field forward at this point in time. So what, what the cutting edge really seems to be at this point, um, and, and many of us believe this, is that a new approach is now required. There's been a lot of focus on describing what households do, 
but we're really now trying to unearth the structure between the surface, trying to get at the why of why households are behaving the way that they are. And this involves naturally a, a lot of behavioral economics, trying to think about the, the factors that motivate households. Uh, and of course, harder still, what are we going to do about it? Once we understand uh, what households are doing and why they're doing it, uh, the question then is, uh, what if anything can we do in terms of optimal policy uh, to change the game? And the ultimate goal of this agenda is actionable advice. And so this involves supporting and informing product design, financial innovation, uh, and of course, policy design as well. So uh, there's, a, there's a number of different ways in which this is already happening. Uh, and I'm going to try and illustrate this with some examples from my own research agenda. Uh, there are administrative data sets now that cover entire populations uh, or indeed large, large representative samples of populations from around the world. And these data sets are becoming, becoming increasingly available as, as I'll show you. Um, and these are often sourced from regulatory organizations but not only from regulatory organizations. And interrogating these data uh, allows us to do a few different things to work not just on the household decision aspect of this, but also thinking about how they aggregate into market level outcomes. So really thinking about what happens to markets when they're populated by agents uh, that have all kinds of behavioral biases, for example. Uh, there's also a lot of power associated with being able to compare countries with each other, and not in a sort of old fashioned sense, but now looking at the granular decisions that households are taking in different countries and being able to compare how they take those decisions in different countries and how that varies by the institutional setup in which those households exist, which might then give us a lever uh, to try to influence the way that those decisions actually occur. And of course, much of this, uh, being at Imperial, uh, also has to do with uh, employing advanced computational methods and machine learning and data science, uh, all of which Imperial is very well known for. Now, what we do in, uh, in economics departments, and hopefully I will, and, and finance uh, departments, uh, is to use the tools of structural economic models. And, and I will make this very clear shortly. And this is really about getting to the why. So we can do a lot of work on description, but getting to the why requires thinking a little bit more about the models that we can write down of households. Uh, and the important thing is that even though every household has its own circumstances, uh, you know, it's a little bit like Anna Karenina, but in the opposite way, which is that, you know, while all happy households are happy in the same way, in this case, it's all unhappy households are unhappy in the same way in some ways. It's not as though they're very different. So there are some common determinants uh, that make households make decisions the way that they do. Uh, and so what we really want to do is to get to the fundamentals. What are household preferences? What sort of beliefs do they have? How do they respond to constraints? What is universal about this? And once we can do that, once we have a sense of what these fundamentals look like, we can peer into alternative worlds. Uh, we can build what it might look like if they were put in a different sort of environment. Once we understand what motivates households, we might be able to pilot changes to the policy environment or to product design in these simulated environments that are grounded by these fundamentals that you might extract from observing their behavior and modeling their behavior in the environment in which they are. And you might imagine this is quite po powerful because you can then build a decision support system for both financial product and policy design. So this is all a bit abstract. So what I want to do is to try to illustrate this with a few examples, and that's what I'm going to do now. Um, so what I want to try and do is to give you some examples from recent work uh, that uh, we've done on how households sell houses, um, how we refinance mortgages. These are very important decisions, big assets, big liabilities, the biggest asset and the biggest liability for most households. Um, and then I want to spend a little bit of time telling you about the international nature of the agenda and the way that technology plays into these sorts of things. So let me start with selling houses. And the house selling decision turns out to be possibly the biggest transaction that most households will conduct in their lifetime. And it turns out that these decisions are often driven by factors that have little to do despite the ticket size uh, or there's an alarming amount that seems to be to do with the way that households are wired in the way that, uh, for example, they're very reluctant to realize losses. Okay? So, and I'm going to show you some patterns uh, that, that, that demonstrate this. The, the sort of what of it is that when you look at large and granular data sets of the way that people sell houses, it reveals that there's extreme household reluctance to sell a property below the price that they paid for it. Now, there may be good reasons to do that, but there may also be some reasons that have to do with the way that we're wired. But it turns out that this has fairly important aggregate implications. So when we write down a structural model, we're able to quantify 
the forces that are at work. One of this, of course, one of these forces is loss aversion. People just seem very wired, and it's not just people. It turns out that people have done experiments with capuchin monkeys that show that they are extremely subject to loss aversion. So our biology, in some sense, is militating against us in this context. Um, and there's also mortgage constraints, of course, and that's gonna become important, and that is actually becoming, it's a live issue at the moment, so we can talk more about that and about the implications of the housing market. Now, the broader consequences of households being very reluctant to sell a property for less than they paid for it is that house price declines can actually lead to freezes in housing market liquidity. In particular, when house prices decline, as they, you know, lots of predictions are making right now, if people are very reluctant to sell houses for less than they paid for it, that means that the natural price is just not going to be realized. What will happen is households will simply mark up their houses and, and liquidity will dry up in the marketplace. That might not sound like a big deal, except for the fact that this is causing lock-in, which is these constraints and this kind of loss aversion, this reluctance to realize losses, can mean that even when there are profitable job opportunities on the table and labor mobility is something that you really wanna encourage, especially in a down market, you might see that households avoid doing this and turn down profitable opportunities simply to avoid taking a loss, okay? So the consequences are, are material. So let me try and convince you that this is the case using uh, large data sets. And in particular, uh, what we did was we went to Denmark and, and Scandinavia is an applied economist's dream because they have extremely granular data tracking entire populations about all kinds of things. And so uh, we looked at the universe of all residential properties in Denmark, which we tracked uh, uh, over close to a decade. And this covers you know, close to 200 odd thousand transactions by 200 thousand odd households. So let me try and describe what this looks like uh, using uh, listing prices for houses. Uh, and let me tell you about this hockey stick. Um, so what's on the x-axis here is the potential gains that you could make. So imagine that you had some kind of estimate, like, a, like right move gives you an estimate for what the fair value of your house is today. And imagine that zero potential gains is when that fair value estimate lands exactly on the price that you paid for the house. So you're making no gains on the house. As you move to the right uh, into 20% and 40% territory, what's happening in those areas is that the, the model is telling you that you're going to make a gain. So your know, broker might be telling you that, look, you can, this is the price that you can put on the market and you can calculate the difference between that and the, the price that you paid for the house and that's 20% up or 40% up. And then on the left-hand side is when you're starting to get into the domain of potential losses. Okay, so you're 20% down or 40% down from the purchase price of your house. What's on the y-axis is the markup that you set on the house above the fair market value of the house. And so what you can see is that essentially what's happening in the gain domain is as you move into gain territory, the markup that you place on the house descends. But as you move to the left, people are trying to offset the loss by jacking up the price of their house as high as they possibly can. And you know, this is going up to 35% and so on and so forth when you're facing a 40% 40, 40 loss. So it's almost as though you're trying to offset almost the entire amount. Now, lest you think that this is a feature of, of Scandinavian or Danish households in this case, this is a plot where we've done this for the UK with 12.4 million transactions from the land registry, matched to over 20 million property listings from Rightmove. And you can see that the UK pattern on the right is virtually indistinguishable from the Danish pattern on the left. So this is really something that's universal that we're picking up. And if anything, what you can see is that the UK has a tendency to offset the loss even more aggressively uh, than, than Denmark does, okay? Now, another way to see this uh, that doesn't rely on any models that you have to, to put forward is by looking at the distribution of sales uh, around realized gains, okay? So what is realized gains? This is simply the percentage difference between the price you received for the house that you sold and the price at which you purchased it. So zero is when you basically just completely break even. This is in pure nominal terms. There's no indexation going on or anything. It's just when you sold the house for exactly what you bought it for. And then as you move to the right, these are people making 10%, 20%, 30%, 40% gains, and so on. And as you move to the left, 10% losses, 20%, 30%, and so on. And what you can see about this that looks very weird is that in exactly at zero, there's a real spike right there, which is basically telling you that you know, people seem to want to focus on that point. Why do they want to focus on that point? Well, look to the left. They really, really hate selling a property for just even 1% less than they bought it for. 
And what that line, the dotted line, the counterfactual line is, is telling you what the distribution should look like if people just sold their houses for fair value, okay? Whatever the fair value estimate is telling you. And so immediately you can see this, and this is called bunching, this kind of pattern where this distribution is bunching. And yet again, lest you think that this is in Denmark, look at the United Kingdom on the right. It's virtually identical. And you can see that the same pattern shows up, again, with very large data sets. And in fact, the excess mass, or the mass exactly at 3.5, you know, the 0% the is 3.5% in the UK relative to 2.5 odd percent in Denmark. So again, the tendency is, if anything, even stronger. So this is a sort of universal phenomenon. Now, this is the what, okay? This is what households do. This is a description of household behavior. Now, the question really is, what can, you know, what can we attribute this to? Where's the why in all of this? Now, this is where the structural model, the structural economic model comes in. The first part of this is all just getting very large amounts of data, learning how to look at it, figuring out the model that needs to be run, using data science and so on and so forth. But now we need to go back to pen and paper and see whether we can write down a model of households that matches the behavior that we've just seen. And this is what we do. So the left hand is our model and how it tells you about what the listing premium is gonna look like. Uh, I'll explain that to you in a second. And the right hand panel is what we think the distribution should look like for different types of utility functions that household might, households might have, okay? So what do I mean by a utility function? I mean, what are households maximizing, okay? What does it seem that households really want? If we could sort of really take a peek in to households' heads or the decision makers' heads, can we write down a model of the way that they operate that sort of simulates or replicates the data that we see in the real world? And that's, that's what we've done here. Let me see if I can explain this to you very simply. If someone doesn't care about gains and losses at all and simply cares about the final sale price of the house, which is what you know, rational uh, economic man or woman should be doing according to our models, then the listing premium, which is the markup that you set over the fair value of the house, should be the flat purple line there. As you move to someone who is anchored on that purchase price and really wants to do well relative to that purchase price, as they have greater and greater gains, the model tells you that they're prepared to lower the markup in order to induce a quick sale. But as you move to the left and they're making losses, they wanna mark it up more and more to offset the loss because they're not as worried about the quick sale. And then the weird looking black line over there is what happens when households are loss averse, when they derive far less utility from losses than they do from gains. And you might look at that and say, well, that doesn't look like the U-shape, I mean, the hockey stick, smooth hockey stick that you had, but it turns out that this is just for a representative household. Um, but what you can do is when you aggregate this across multiple households, you get exactly the sort of pattern that you see in the data. And the right-hand side is exactly the same utility function produces bunching inside the model. So what, what can we do with this? The nice thing about this is I can take these two patterns, I can take this pattern and this one, and I can minimize the distance between what my model predicts and what these patterns look like in the data so I can make these plots look exactly like or very close to those two plots that I showed you already. And this is essentially by fiddling around with the model to sort of tweak the parameters of the model so that we can figure out exactly how we can model households and exactly what quantities and how much they respond to incentives and so on and so forth. Now those are the fundamentals that I've been referring to so far. What's nice about having those fundamentals and having this machine, assuming that it works and assuming you can validate it, is that you can then start thinking about throwing different policies at households and saying, how would they respond if house prices fell by X amount? How would it uh, work if we were to change mortgage policy in a particular way and so on and so forth? So now you're at least hopefully trying, starting to get a flavor of, of how, this, how this works. So, in the model, as it turns out, and this is not something I've shown you, but what we do is we sort of parse the relative strength of different forces, and it turns out that both mortgage constraints and these kinds of behavioral preferences, these loss averse preferences, roughly equally contribute to lock-in. And so a policy proposal that comes straight out of this, the what to do about it, is that as soon as you see a housing downturn, what you should be doing is to relax financing constraints in order to offset the effect of households' behavioral preferences. And how might you do this? For example, right now, if we're gonna face 
a big rise in interest rates and the housing market is gonna fall, we may wanna relax loan to value constraints, for example, okay? And the model can tell you roughly how much, given the various dials that you have uh, in the system that you've built. Now, will such counter-cyclical mortgage policy help and how much? Well, the answer is yes, and it can potentially have fairly large effects. Uh, but it turns out that there's a subtle point, and I think this will be maybe familiar to some of you, which is that when you have tighter financial constraints, what we find is that people are less behavioral. They don't indulge their loss aversion quite as much because they're up against the wall. But what happens when you loosen financial constraints is that it just gives people more space to be themselves, to essentially indulge their behavioral preferences. So this is in some sense a sort of a little bit of a, a problem because when I move one lever, when I reduce the amount of mortgage pressure that's on you, suddenly you might feel a little bit freer to exercise your loss averse preferences. So there's this a little bit of an offsetting effect that's going on here. It's a little bit subtle. Now, what I wanna do next is to turn to household liabilities and show you a little bit about mortgage refinancing. Why? Because if I think about a household as having a balance sheet, on the asset side of the balance sheet, there's the house. This is the largest asset on households' balance sheets. And on the liability side, there's usually the mortgage, which is the largest household liability. And this is something that's been in the news a lot recently. Uh, and the most important decision about, uh, that people face after taking a loan is refinancing. And that's coming up for a lot of households for whom their initial fixed rate teaser deal is expiring. Some of you may be in that position where interest rates are gonna spike up and you're gonna have to figure out how to refinance your mortgage at that point in time. I, I will talk about the UK, uh, but I, I wanna talk again first about Denmark and then I'm gonna talk about the United Kingdom. So, Here's what happened in Denmark between 2009 and 2017. It was a falling interest rate environment, unlike the rising interest rate environment that we have right now in the United Kingdom. And you can see here that the black line is showing you from 2010 to about 2017 how the interest rate declined. Now what are those colored, colorful lines over there? Those colorful lines are basically telling you this is the mortgage rate. When the mortgage rate hits each one of those colored, colored lines, this tells you that it's the best time for you to refinance your mortgage into whatever the interest rate that's available at the moment, depending on what coupon or what rate your old mortgage was paying. Now it's not obvious that you should immediately refinance as soon as the interest rate declines, because you might wanna wait and figure out whether the interest rate's gonna go down even further before you pay the fee and get locked into another mortgage of five years or 10 years or whatever it might be. And so those lines are actually representing the rational point at which you wanna refinance. And so when it hits that threshold, if everybody was rational, what you'd see is there would be a wave of refinancing happening for all the mortgages of a particular coupon, and then nothing would happen afterwards because everyone would just refinance and then they would just you know, sit in their new mortgages and that would be it. And so the bottom shows you actually the number of refinancing households at each coupon and so what you should see is that when the black line hits the thing that's just above four, you should see a big wave of the sort of slightly darker blue, the one that's second from the top, and then nothing afterwards. But what you actually see is people are just incredibly sluggish. They seem to procrastinate. And so you see an initial wave, yes, but then after that you see more, and then you, you kind of see these people all the way through. They just keep going through. Some of these people are taking years to actually refinance their mortgages well past the point that we might think that they should. So there seems to be some inertia in the system. And so this is quite important. Um, and you can see this for almost every coupon rate that you notice. So what do we do? Again, we write down a structural model to try to explain how households refinance. And it has to have two components, as it turns out, to match the data. And those rich patterns in individual switching behavior are matched by these two components. The first one, that we find is that the incentive to switch differs across individuals. So there are some very wealthy people out there who really can't be bothered to pay attention to their mortgage because there are more important concerns occupying their time. The op opportunity cost of their time is substantially higher than the saving that they would make from refinancing their mortgage. And so we find that some of them take quite a while to refinance. The switching cost of doing something different, going and looking at your mortgage, uh, can be embedded in that incentive to switch that differs across individuals, okay? But there's another component which is a bit more worrying, which is what we call sleepiness, okay? Which is even if we set a person-specific incentive for you, there are people who basically just seem oblivious to that incentive until well after the fact 
uh, of the saving being the appropriate time for them to refinance. And they sort of suddenly wake up and then they go and refinance afterwards. And a model that, that has that feature uh, seems well able to explain the data that we have. Now, let's go to the what should we do about it aspect of this. So we've done the, the what, I've kind of quickly given you a sense of the why, uh, and now there's a, there's a what can we do about it. And so let's try and do this by simulating an economy where we implement a, a mortgage rate cut, okay, or an interest rate cut that, that tra translates into a reduction in the mortgage rate that should induce 90% of borrowers in Denmark to refinance, okay? Uh, now, why, why would that be a good thing from the perspective of the Central Bank of Denmark, or, or why does the Bank of England do these kinds of things? Well, there may be a few reasons. The first is to ease the financial burden on households. So one of the things that people are now saying is maybe we want to slow the pace of interest rate increases so that we keep households a little bit healthier in terms of their financial health. We don't push them to the wall in terms of these high mortgage rates that they have to pay. The other one is, of course, when you have a lower amount of mortgage debt that you have to pay, you might want to go out there and spend. So it stimulates the economy, it increases consumption. And so the questions that you might want to ask if you're at the Bank of England or the Central Bank of Denmark or any central bank for that matter is, how quickly do households respond? How much do I have to pull the interest rate down? What do I have to do in order to have all these wonderful effects go through to the economy? What can we do about it? Okay. So. Here's our little simulation, uh, and this is a paper that's joint with John Campbell, who's gonna give uh, the ending remarks, in addition to Stefan Anderson and Casper Nielsen. Um, and here, imagine that in this simulated world, there's a rate cut at time zero, and then you should expect, in a rational world, that 90% of households should refinance, because that's the way we've set it up in the model, and then there's no more refinancing for years after the initial rate cut. Now, given what we see in the data about the sluggishness and the model that we have, this is the actual behavior that we would predict from the model. So even though you've made an enormous rate cut, you basically get an extremely slow response. And so even after three years, less than 50% of the households have responded to the rate cut that you, that you made. So what can we do about it? One possibility is that you just say to everyone, okay, I'm gonna rebate the fixed fee that you pay to, to refinance your mortgage. I'm gonna give everyone 350 pounds in the economy and let's see how that does. And of course, for the people whose incentives are very different and whose opportunity cost is higher, this is actually reducing the cost and should increase the net benefit and this should get a lot of people into the system. Turns out it doesn't really do anything, okay? When you do that, you just don't get much of a response. Okay, so what should we do about it? It turns out that the sleepiness is the important bit of this. And so if we were to be able to go out there and expend similar types of resources on waking households up and saying, you have to take advantage of this initiative, we bombard them with mailers, I understand that this is unpalatable, okay? You know, don't shoot the messenger. But, but if, you, if, you, if you did this kind of thing and you woke 50% of the households up, this would be the response. The wake up policy that woke 50% of the people up and said, hey, here's an opportunity, please pay attention to it, then it turns out that you get a much better looking response. Now, of course, you can combine the two policies and that's the dotted line at the very top. And, and, and in some, you know, you're getting, at the very end, you're getting some errors. You're getting more people than you should refinance, but that's a very small fraction, getting about 95% to do it rather than 90, but that's three years out, okay? So, so what's nice about this is that this machine has allowed you to sort of build these little policy simulations and tell people uh, in, to sort of provide some policy decision support about what, how best to do it. Okay, there's a little bit of a, an issue here. I haven't talked yet about inequality and I wanna spend some time talking about that. And so the rich and well-educated we find are substantially more efficient at refinancing. So this is one of the big problems here that we detected using the data. In the Danish data, we can see lots of things about you. We can see your education, your income, we can see how much housing wealth you have, and so on and so forth. And relative to someone, 100% would be someone who refinanced exactly the way that you know, clinical economists like myself would tell you that you need to refinance. And it turns out that if you're you know, sort of quite poor at the 10th percentile of the housing wealth distribution or 10th percentile of the education distribution, you're only doing this at about half the efficiency that you should, but then as you move up in terms of education, income, and housing wealth to the 90th percentile of the distributions of all of those variables, you're really seeing that the efficiencies are going up, okay? And this is really quite bad because it's saying that, you know, this kind of bad financial management is highly correlated with the sorts of things that we worry about in terms of inequality. Uh, unfortunately, aging is also correlated with poorer refinancing efficiency. I'm sorry to, 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 to let you all know about this. Okay. 
Okay, so here's a, a sort of taking this one step further, which is, you know, what happens uh, with this transfer to the poor, from the poor to the rich? Is there a different way that we could do this uh, that didn't involve these kinds of transfers from one type of household to the other. And this is trying to attack this question of whether differences in mortgage refinancing can actually you know, contribute to wealth inequality through this differential financial ability that households have. And it turns out that many of you know this, there's a dual rate structure in the UK market. There's a teaser rate that you initially have, which is quite low, and then it just could roll down to this very high standard variable rate if you don't refinance immediately at the expiration of your teaser rate period. That SVR at the moment could be anywhere from seven or eight percent. So unless you switch very promptly, you're getting hit with this very, very high cost. And it turns out that when you look at vast data from the United Kingdom, which we have access to through the FCA and the Bank of England, uh, 3.59 million mortgages, I think, is what we look at in terms of the sample and roughly 430 billion pounds of mortgages. And we have detail down to the level of the mortgages. And we can see that people are simply not making these decisions. About 30% of the aggregate mortgage stock is sitting on these high standard variable rates rather than refinancing on time. What's more, and what's more troubling, is that the less well-off are switching less than they should, which means that they are essentially paying a price and a transfer to the more well-off. So there are these cross-subsidies or regressive transfers across population groups. So the question is why? And again, it's because this sort of sleepiness seems to be higher for low-income groups uh, in the population. So what can, you, what can we do about it? So again, we can try and pilot an alternative policy where you eliminate the dual rate structure. This is something that my colleague David Miles in 2004 wrote a report for uh, Gordon Brown about and said we should eliminate this structure. Essentially, this doesn't seem to be a great structure. And what we can do is we can quantify the extent to which that would help. And it turns out it does help. So what would happen in that alternative world is that the interest rate would go up for the 80th to the top income decile of the population, okay? So eight-tenths of the income distribution would face higher mortgage rates, and the rest of the income distribution would face lower mortgage rates in that alternative world that we can peer into with our model. And essentially, that is getting transferred back to the people at the bottom of the pyramid, essentially. Is what, that's what would happen in that alternative world. And we can say this now with this very vast data, this model that we built, and so on. What would then happen in that world, according to our model, and this is a bit more speculative, is that people at the lower ends of the income distribution would essentially take on more mortgages. Seven and a half, six to seven and a half percent at the bottom of the income distribution. Why is that? Because, because they don't have to pay these nuisance fees and because they don't have to pay this extremely high rate, they might be induced to then come into the mortgage market according to our simulations. Of course, this is peering into the unknown, but that's precisely the point of counterfactual analysis. Okay, and by the way, there are also redistributive transfers across the United Kingdom. In particular, in this brave new world, which doesn't have this teaser rate structure and has a single mortgage rate across the lifetime of the contract, London and the southeast of England start paying slightly higher rates, but you can see that the people who are paying lower rates are the ones in lighter blue that are in the northwest and northeast of the country. And our predictions for mortgage issuance go very similarly, which is you'd get lower mortgage issuance in these parts of the country and a bit more redistributive transfers out to other parts of the country. Okay, so I think I've got a, a few minutes left. Um, and what I wanna do is to quickly talk about um, the fact that this agenda is not just domestic in nature, it's not just about the UK, it's not also just about the US or about Denmark, it's truly international. And what we really need to do is to go to both advanced and emerging economies, because there are many similarities, and I'm gonna tell you a little bit about this graph on the right, and there's a real opportunity and a need for more research. Uh, the agenda that we're sort of trying to pursue here does include a significant focus on both emerging economies as well as advanced economies. Now, this is a plot from a, a review paper that I wrote with uh, Christine Badarinza, uh, who I should thank for also really helping me put together this presentation. He's a frequent co-author, and Vimal Balasubramanian was in the room, uh, who's a professor at Queen Mary University of London, who also helped me. Uh, with this, and we have this paper together. And what this shows is the wealth distribution in developed economies on the y-axis and the wealth distribution in developed uh, or, or emerging economies uh, on the x-axis. So what is this saying? It's saying that the poorest person uh, in developed economies, which is zero on the y-axis, is not that far off from the poorest person in developing economies, zero on the x-axis. At the very top of the distribution, the richest people in developed economies, looking at household surveys from all of these countries, are actually pretty similar to the richest people in the emerging economies. 
The big gap is in the middle, which is if I look at a person who is six tenths of the way up the wealth distribution in an emerging economy, in some economies, like for example the Philippines, they're only 10% of the way up the wealth distribution in developed economies. And this gap varies across countries. So Philippines is in some ways bad, but there's all of these other countries, South Africa, Thailand, China, and India, there's a bigger problem because it's not just inequality between the bottom and the top, there's also substantial inequality between the middle and the top as well. There's a sort of a real need to do more of this. And these are people who are in formal financial markets for the first time, facing the sorts of challenges, mortgage refinancing, buying houses, selling houses, and so on and so forth, that makes this agenda perhaps even more important in those areas. And if we care about household finance, we care about households and not just about the size of the market. And there are many households that are not in developed economies around the world. Okay, um, we tried to do something about this. Um, I chaired a committee in 2016 and then we submitted our report in 2017 that was constituted by the Reserve Bank of India, uh, 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 of India under the then governor, Raghuram Rajan. And in that committee, what we did was we tried to sort of put some of these ideas into action by benchmarking households against those in other major <laughs> world markets, and then trying to think about how we would redesign new systems of regulations in financial markets uh, and in household finance to try to make financial inclusion really work and make household finance better. And what we did was we highlighted that there's enormous household financial vulnerability. In particular, there's a huge inability to cope with unexpected emergencies. This is not just, by the way, in emerging countries. This is also a problem here in the developed markets. Um, and there's a, a high dominance of info, informal sources of high cost credit. So if you get into trouble, then what then happens is you get into financial trouble, you go and take a loan that has a very high interest rate. You might then get into a debt trap. And we found that that was a very serious problem. And now, of course, this is not restricted to there. I suspect many of the issues that we're gonna see uh, will be seen here. I, I think John Campbell put it best, and he'll say something at the end, that we had a tendency to think that all emerging countries would start looking like developed countries. I think what we're starting to realize is that many developed countries could start looking like emerging countries as well. Okay, so these problems are really universal. Okay, so we had some policy proposals and so on and so forth, but one of the main policy proposals was a very strong role that we advocated for technology. Now, the last thing I wanna say is that technology is really something that's fantastic, and we might have this vision of this brave new utopian world in which technology solves all of our problems, but it's not a panacea, okay? And in particular, there are some issues associated with doing this by just running technology through and saying FinTech is gonna fix everything. And we did this by looking at a particular case, which is the adoption of machine learning credit screening technologies uh, and risk profiling technologies using large data from the US. We went to the US Federal Reserve and we got 10 million loans from them. And what we did is we ran some fairly advanced credit screening models using ML, using machine learning, and sort of trying to figure out what people's credit scores would be under that new system. And then compared those credit scores against the credit scores that are standard everyday risk profiling system that we have today might have, okay? And in particular, what we found is that there are some risks. In particular, the, uh, the good thing is that when the new technology comes in, it does seem to be a rising tide that lifts all boats. But the problem is that it exacerbates distributional issues between different groups. Some people are better off than other people. So this is like George Orwell, right? Which is all animals are equal, but some animals are more an uh, equal than other animals. I don't know if you've ever read Animal Farm. Um, and why is that? It's because advanced technology can more effectively figure out who you are, even if the data is supposed to be anonymized and we're not supposed to be able to tell whether you're black or white or Hispanic or you know, old or young or male or female, but you can get, make the invisible visible. The other thing is that advanced technology can actually identify risk hotspots that are invisible to more primitive technology and so that uncovers existing vulnerabilities. So, so let me just sort of show you this, this very quick graph which is just showing you what happens when you move to a credit score uh, from an old system, that's the one on the right, the nonlinear logit, to one from a new system, which is a more sophisticated machine learning technique called the random forest. And what this is saying is that, you know, essentially these lines are cumulative distributions, but what they're actually telling you is that if I think about the people who would win under the new system, where their credit score was actually better off in the new system, you can see that Asians and white non-Hispanics in the data 
about 65 odd percent of them are benefiting and about 35 odd percent of them are doing worse under the new system. But then when you compare that to the way that white Hispanic and black uh, borrowers are doing, you can see that they benefit less. About 50% of them are doing better and about 50% of them are doing worse under the new system. So the gains are unevenly distributed. The Asians and the whites do much better. The blacks and the Hispanics are about the same as they are right now. Okay, so let me just wrap up. Um, household finance is entering this very exciting phase. We're able to use all of these tools. Uh, we can really unearth the structure between the surface. Uh, these are big questions. I hope I've been able to convince you of that. And moving the field forward requires using these, these pretty interesting tools, large-scale administrative data, structural modeling, and counterfactual analysis, peering into an alternative world. And here are a few things that we're looking at right now. How do households search for real assets and financial products is a big question that we have now. What transfers arise from these different levels of sophistication across the population? Is there better, a better designed financial system that we can put on the table? This is not just the problem in mortgage refinancing. These cross subsidies show up in credit, they show up in insurance, they show up in payments processing, they show up everywhere, essentially they're ubiquitous. Um, and of course this question of technology. Are algorithms the solution for high quality financial management at low cost? And there's a trade off here about personal data. We're thinking about that question. And we're also thinking a little bit more about how households might interact with algorithms. Okay, so I'm out of time, but I just wanted to mention that it really does take a village, okay? These are some selected set of co-authors on different proje uh, projects. Many of them are in the room. Um, and so this is really a collective endeavor. It's not just something that gets done by one person. So it's not just an inaugural lecture. Well, I mean, it's six years too late for an inaugural lecture, but, <laughs> but hopefully this inaugurates an agenda um, and, and there are many contributors to this agenda. So thanks very much for listening, and I think I'll just leave you with the Q&A. Thank you, Tarun, for a fascinating lecture. We have some time for a few questions, if people have them. Uh, with a microphone coming, Ravi. Brilliant talk, Tharun. Any, any talk that uh, inserts George uh, Orwell and, uh, and Tolstoy into it has my vote. So thank you for that. Um, on the, the changing of uh, mortgage product question, there is quite a rich expectational literature on uh, you know, ARMs versus fixed rate mortgages in the US. Did you integrate that into some of the work that you did in Denmark and the UK? Um, yeah, so uh, absolutely. In fact, both John Campbell, who will give uh, the sort of closing notes here, and myself, we've, we've done work on these topics in the United States uh, as well. Um, and, and the answer is yes. Uh, some of these switching problems uh, in Denmark, as it happens, the switching is on, about fixed rate mortgages. And in the UK, it's about adjustable rate mortgages with a short duration. So the difference between those two settings is that with a fixed rate mortgage, you have to spend some time calculating the right level of interest rates at which you have to switch. In the United Kingdom, it's particularly easy to decide when to switch because there's no real value of waiting given how punitive the standard variable rate that you move on to. So the switching de decision is particularly easy in the context of the UK. So, you know, pro tip, uh, switch your mortgage as soon as it comes off of <laughs> the fixed rate teaser deal because there's really no advantage to waiting to time interest rates because the carry cost that you're paying is just so high. Thank you. We have some people online, so we have a question from online. We do. So uh, in the case of the loss aversion we re with respect to the price at which people uh, choose to sell their house, uh, does the result actually take into account uh, transaction costs such as stamp duties or legal fees, or do people actually see those as separate? And if that's the case, um, do you see that as an additional bias? Yeah, um, so maybe I can just go back and see if I can do this by just showing you the plot, which is kind of the easiest way to answer that question, which is a great question. Um, and the answer is that, you know, what we did, okay, so you can see this in bunching, I think, perhaps best, and you can see this in the UK the best, which is, um, you see this big spike here at exactly zero, which is exactly the price you paid for it. 
But you might imagine that when you have paid some transactions costs and some stamp duty and you expect some price appreciation, that the reference point that you have is not the purchase price that you paid for it. In fact, it was kind of surprising to us that we find such sharp evidence that the price that you paid for it is precisely the point at which you see this very sharp bunching. But what I hope you'll also have noticed is that there's this sort of pileup of observations also to the right of zero that suggests that there may be many people who have reference points around here, okay, to the right. And so a richer model would actually account for that shift and so on and so forth. But even so, you still see this very striking evidence that's happening exactly at zero. So hopefully that's answered the question. Over here. Yeah, I think there's a mic coming. Mm -hmm. One point I'd like to bring up is that I've had 50 years' experience of conveyancing and putting transactions into place, and I think that the last thing that the country needs, like a hole in the head, is to complicate the system up anymore. There has been a long feeling in this country that housing exists to protect people to give them a roof over their heads and that sort of thing. And it is immoral to use your home and to risk your family for making money. Really. You shouldn't get into a business you don't know about. And it is quite remarkable that the one new financial product or the one newly <coughs> hyped financial product which is really taking off and being, being appreciated is equity release, which people like for the simplicity of it. You can withdraw so much money to set up your grandkids in, in their own homes, get them on the property ladder, and then you can just go back and somebody's done a calculation for you saying that you will be all right for the rest of your life, staying at the place you love. And you don't need to move on to downsize. You don't, ha yep. you don't have to deal with solicitors, sure. and you don't end up with a ruddy landlord yeah. micro-organising yeah. so, so I, I uh, your house. Yeah, let, let me, there uh, is a big yeah. emotional element. I, I, I completely agree market. with you. I mean, I think that the reverse mortgage market here is is certainly something that should be developed. In fact, economists talk all the time about how important that market is. And it's, I agree, it's, 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 a, it's an issue about why it is that it hasn't developed to quite the extent that it ought to. And it certainly warrants further investigation. So we will certainly be looking into that more seriously. So thank you for bringing that up. There's one behind the question. Yes, please. So I'm curious, um, as an American, where there's capital gains on your primary residence, um, even if you don't live in the United States, the, uh, I'm curious about the potential tax implications, because if you had a scenario where if you had a loss uh, that you would get uh, you know, a, a tax benefit that you could offset that loss against uh, you know, yeah. other income or other gains, uh, whether that might help deal with the, you know, the issue of, of people being stuck on the, you know, the nominal price yes. that they, they paid for the home. So that's, yeah. so that's one. Yeah. And then I'm curious, uh, you know, whether if people put a lot of money into their homes, whether that, whether that shows up in the data or not, you know, because obviously if you expand your home, if you yes. add to it, presumably you should think about your, your basis as being a lot higher than what you paid for it. Sure. So l let me take those. Uh, yeah, I think both are great questions. Um, now, as far as tax loss selling is concerned, you're quite right that it should help offset some of these effects. But it turns out that you see precisely the same effect. It's called the disposition effect when people are selling stocks. Um, and it turns out that even when stocks should be sold at losses to do tax loss harvesting, you find roughly similar types of behavior which is that people are extremely uh, quick to realize gains and very reluctant to realize losses. In fact, the proportion of gains realized to losses realized is roughly 2.5. 
And that doesn't matter whether you're in India or the UK or the US, that finding has come out over and over again. Uh, your second question is about renovations and whether that effectively changes the reference price for the house. Another great question. It turns out that because Denmark is an applied economist's dream, we can see the amount of money you put in for renovations because there's a tax exemption for renovations in Denmark. So the tax authority gives us the amount that you sought for the tax exemption. And even when we add that in, it turns out that it doesn't take away this tendency to really be focused on the purchase price of the house. One more here. That's very interesting. So I have a question. So, uh, you know, in economics, as you know, you treat a house <clears throat> as a potential investment asset or as consumption foregone because it's savings. So to what extent in this field can you uh, sort of address the two following questions? Is there a difference in behavior when uh, that depends on the rental yield from a home? And Dep Sorry, it depends on the... Rental yield from uh -huh. a home. Uh, and you know, sort of behaviors of households when they transact in the property market. Yeah. And two, if you were to estimate consumption foregone mm -hmm. by sleepiness, would that be of an order of magnitude as a macroeconomist I'm interested? Mm -hmm. That would have macro implications because then yeah. in countercyclical policy, if people are being sleepy, yeah. then the effectiveness of countercyclical macro policy to stimulate consumption would be limited, right? Yeah. Um, so let me see if I can take those questions in. Uh, reverse order, and I'm going to forget, so I'm going to ask you to remind me about the, the first question again, which, uh, okay. So th the second question is, there's been a lot of work in macro using these kinds of behavioral preferences, and, and it turns out that not only consumers are sleepy, so consumption responds with a lag, but it turns out that producers are sleepy as well. So menu adjustments, or essentially price setting behavior by firms, has also been tackled using similar frameworks, like with sleepiness and so on and so forth. So as far as a macroeconomist is concerned, this kind of behavioral toolkit shows up not just in consumption behavior, it also shows up in price adjustment behavior of firms. We're documenting that it shows up in the household context in terms of household refinancing. Um, I think I now remember your first question, which is, I think maybe let me, let me try to put it a different way, which is suppose you're a professional investor or a speculator, do you still have the same kind of loss aversion that you do if you're a homeowner? Okay, now what we're doing here is really about residential real estate purchases where you're the principal homeowner. And it is the case that people have found that these tendencies are reduced for professional investors, but not eliminated for professional investors. So this is quite interesting and it's, it's important. Now some investment committees will put, will put policies into place where you just have rules. Sell if the price descends by 10% full stop. You just have to sell it and then you have to think about it again, about whether you wanna buy it back at that point. You incur the transactions cost as a way to discipline yourself to be able to confront your own loss aversion. Um, and so those, those kinds of mechanical rules can be helpful. Thank you, I'm sure we can go on having questions for many time longer, but we need to move on. And it's my great pleasure to uh, introduce for our vote of thanks, uh, Professor John Campbell, who is the Morton and Carol Olshan Professor of Economics at Harvard University. John, the floor is yours. Great, thank you very much. Uh, can, can you hear me? Yes. Well, it's, it's a, a huge pleasure to be here with you to thank Tarun for this really fascinating inaugural lecture. I've known Tarun now for over 20 years since his time in the Business Economics PhD program at Harvard. And it's been a tremendous thrill in that time to see Tarun increasing the scope and the intellectual ambition of his research agenda to the point where it can support a wholesale rethinking of the entire structure of the financial system. And I, I will say personally that during these 20 years, some of my own most rewarding professional experiences have been working on joint research projects with Tarun, discussing big questions in finance with him, and getting to know him as a personal friend. Very early in his career, Tarun decided that he was interested not just in asset prices, but in the positions that investors take and the trades that achieve these positions. And Tarun began by working with his advisor, Ken Fruit, on capital flows, and then he became one of the world's experts on hedge funds in uh, an influential series of, of papers with David Shea, Narayan Naik, Andrew Patton, and others. Tarun's papers on these topics are still some of his most widely cited. 
But as you now know, he's shifted his attention from institutions to households, and that's the main focus of his work since the middle of the last decade. Another decision that Tarun made very early was to take a truly global perspective on finance. He's never shared the Anglo-American illusion that the US and the UK are the only places of interest, or that they set the quality standards for financial structure. Tarun's written several survey papers that compare financial structure and decisions across countries, and he's dug deeply into micro data from countries as different as India, Denmark, and the UK, as you, as you just heard. His policy involvements also cross the borders of countries and continents. What I find really impressive about Tarun's recent work is the way in which he's now combining theory and empirics. As you've heard, the theory he brings to bear contains both behavioral elements and careful consideration of traditional price effects on budgets and incentives. And Tarun is applying this theory to enormous administrative data sets on house sales, mortgage choices, stock trading decisions, and on and on. The, by using theory in this way, he's able to make statements about how households would behave and how their decisions would play out, not only in the financial system we have, but in alternative systems that we may be able to design. And a major theme of this work, which Tarun touched on in his lecture, is the desirability of eliminating cross-subsidies from the poor to the rich. So Tarun was very highbrow. He quoted Orwell. He quoted Tolstoy. So I think I should quote Monty Python. Dennis Moore, Dennis Moore, steals from the poor, gives to the rich. And perhaps I'll stop there and I won't finish the quote. Um, but, uh, you know, these cross subsidies are really pervasive. We're learning more and more about this. And um, I think the attention that Tarun is bringing to this problem is, is really important. Uh, personally, I find this agenda as exciting as anything that's happening in economics across all fields. I'm involved in it myself, but quite frankly, to make progress, we need people at the absolute peak of their lifetime energy and skill, and that means people like Tarun. So I think we should all be grateful for the work we've heard about today and the implications it has for building a better financial system. Uh, Tarun, I would like to offer a vote of thanks for your extraordinary inaugural lecture. Thank you. Thank you. We have drinks and a reception outside for those of you who have time to join us and continue questioning Tarun.